So this is uh, sacred families, developing the family according to God's design. This is lesson number nine in the series uh, and it is entitled Family Mobile, Seven Ways to Look at the Christian Home. Family Mobile, Seven Ways to Look at the Christian Home. So when, I, when I'm talking about family mobile, I'm not talking about mobility as in mobile home or portability. I'm actually talking about an art form as developed by people such as Alexander Calder. He was a, an American sculptor and artist who was credited with introducing, I think you'll, you'll recognize what he, what he has created, the mobile. I think all of us as kids have made some of those in school, the mobile, as an artistic medium in the early 20th century. Here's another sample of that. Originally, uh, Calder was trained as an engineer uh, studied art in New York, subsequently settled in Paris. He later returned to the U.S. and worked primarily um, as a sculptor, producing many large outdoor pieces. And coming from Montreal, I noted that one of his outdoor pieces was made for Expo 67, which was the, the world, exhibit, uh, world exhibition in Montreal. Uh, but what he was best known for were his mobiles, which were created with uh, various materials, they were attached with wires, they were hung to display, usually moved by the wind. Here's another sample of one. Uh, his mobile creations had uh, uh, beauty, balance, form, motion. You could make them with an unending number of materials and styles, but they were always recognizable as mobiles, I, again, I remember as a kid in school making these with the wires and you know, you'd have to bring in uh, coat hangers, I remember, and bend them and then hang you know, the fishing line, I guess, the, the teacher had given us, and we'd attach little things to them, and we'd make our own um, uh, mobiles. Let's see if I got another sample. There's one. Beautiful things. So in her book entitled, What is Family? Author Edith Schaefer says that families are very much like these mobiles. That's my point, if you're wondering. What's he talking about mobiles? Families are a lot like these mobile creations. Um, they're connected, yet they're different. They're counterbalanced so that to remove one of these elements upsets the others. They are displaying a separate yet beautiful unit as a whole. All the pieces are different, they're hung differently, and yet all together they make for a beautiful piece of structure. Endless variety, but always recognizable as family. So in this session, we're going to look at the family as a living mobile, and we're going to examine different elements that can create beauty, balance, and form in the sacred family. So imagine that you were creating one of these family mobiles. What elements, you know, if you're creating one you know, in art class, will say, well, I think I'm going to, one person will say, well, I'll make mine with metal and I'll take a, you know, a, a piece of, uh, I don't know, rebar, a little piece of rebar over here and another little piece of metal, a metal tin cup over here. You know, I'm going to create my mobile. Well, what, what, what would you do if it was a family? How would you, what pieces would, would go together to create a family? Mobile. So here's a, here's a couple of ideas uh, for elements in your family mobile. One of the elements would be a balanced environment. Balanced environment. The family is God's design for the produ uh, producing and nurturing of human beings. And like the creation itself, it needs to be balanced. You know, many years ago, the communist Chinese government began a program to kill off sparrows because they felt that these birds were eating way too much of the rice crop in one of the provinces. When they devastated the bird population in one area, the insects that had been eaten by these birds grew and totally devoured the rice crop anyways. They learned not to create imbalance. Same idea in families. In the same way, God created balance in the family so it could be fruitful in honoring Him and enjoy His blessings. So when we uh, tamper with His balance in the family environment, there are always negative results. 
So someone is saying, okay, I hear what you're saying, balance. What is it? What's the balance? Well, the balance that God created was oneness, despite the gender and emotional differences in the partners within a marriage. There's the balance. For example, he made woman to be beautiful and desirable to man and vice versa. That men are attracted to women is not like a, an invention. It's not a psycho-psychological thing that males said, you know what, I think I'm going to desire the, these things that are these people that are not like me at all. The desire of a man for a woman and the desire of a woman for a man, this is a God thing. God created that. God you know, wired us to be that way. That opposite genders attract is something that God created in order to produce balance in the family despite differences. So after the fall uh, through sin, uh, God instituted roles within marriage in order to mitigate man's tendency towards sin and maintain the oneness and the balance in relationships that would now be continually challenged by sinfulness. In other words, before sin, there was perfect balance between man and woman. There were no roles. God didn't create man and woman and then say to the woman, you, you need to be in subjection to your husband before sin. Of course not. There was perfect balance because there, was, there were no sins. There was no competition within the unit for primacy. Adam didn't use his physical strength to dominate Eve. And Eve did not use her more complex psychology to overthrow Adam. They were in perfect harmony together. Together they were responsible for managing the creation. God didn't say to Adam, okay, you're in charge of the creation and, and you, well, you, know, you, you take care of the home. They were both in charge. They had a shared responsibility. There was no conflict. But sin changed all of that. And so now because of sinfulness, yeah, males would ultimately begin to use their stronger physical nature to dominate the weaker, quote, gender. And females would use their more complex psychological makeup again to overthrow. To do what? Well, to, 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 to gain primacy. So that balanced environment today consists of one man and one woman committed to a lifetime relationship in a legal marriage as opposed to two men or two women, or purposefully single parents, or one man and several women, or a man and a woman living together without any commitment to legal marriage, those are all human inventions. It's not, God didn't invent that. These arrangements are possible and they're becoming quite acceptable in our society, but they do not resemble the balanced environment originally conceived for marriage by God. People say to me, well, it's the same thing. You know, we've been together 25 years. You know, it's the same thing. Who needs a marriage license? And I said, well, obviously you guys don't need a marriage license, but if you want to have the highest possible commitment, if you want to make the highest possible commitment before God, well, then that will require you to have a legal marriage. The world won't condemn you because of that. It's just if you're saying, I want to have the highest commitment level with this other person before God, well, okay, fine. That, that thing is called marriage. <laughs> we're, we're foolish to argue with people, oh, you don't really love each other if you didn't bother getting legally married, but you've been living together for 10 years. Of course not, those people love each other. Well, who? You can't judge a thing like that. It's not about love, it's about commitment. Secondly, the balanced environment also contains role models for men and women to conform to within marriage. Remember, this is after sin enters the world. These roles were not necessary before sin, but they become necessary after a sinful world. Why? To maintain balance. So men as spiritual and moral leaders, protectors of their family, I know that sounds awfully old fashioned, but that's, you know, that's a biblical. And women willingly, key word, 
willingly offering their submission to their husbands and charged with the formation of the home and family. Again, not talking about a woman not being able to work outside the home. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. Actually, when it talks about that, it says that women should be workers at home, meaning when you are at home, you should be workers. Now, a lot of people debate or reject these roles in light of today's society and ideas about male and female roles, but what we can't what can't be rejected or debated is this is what the Bible describes as roles of men and women in marriage. Again, why? To maintain balance in marriage. So God has assigned these so that there can be peace and harmony within marriages and families. So considering the high rate of divorce among those who reject these quote traditional roles, we can assume that God has given us the best way to ensure happy and peaceful relationships within, within marriage. Uh, another piece, the balanced environment also requires a commitment of both partners to the priority of the family. Hillary Clinton, I think we, we know who she is, former Secretary of State, presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton wrote a book and is fond of saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. And I think in a sense she's right, that everyone should feel a responsibility for the well-being and the discipline of children if they're around us. You know, of course I care for my children and I care for our grandchildren, but um, if I see a child in church, that's in trouble or in danger, even though they're not my child, I, I want to protect that child. If I see a child you know, doing things that are you know, going to bring them to harm or to sadness or sorrow or whatever, I care about that child, even though that child isn't mine. I want to do what I can to help you know, steer that child away from those type of things. So yes, it's true, we're, we're all responsible, if you wish, in a sense, for each other's children. But before the village comes the parents. <laughs> the parents are first, not the village. In today's society, it seems that parents have given over their parenting duties to the village and they've bailed out. <coughs> you know, people get married and they have children and they think that the house and the children will care for themselves while they pursue careers, hobbies, and other interests. <laughs> Kids don't raise themselves, although some of them have. It doesn't dawn on some people that marriage makes your partner the priority over every other person in the world. Marriage isn't when you, you, know, you get married and you add on a person. Yeah, before it was me and now I got this other person over here, you know, but I'll, you know, I'll, you know, I'll do enough to take care of that person. No, 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 no. When you get married, that person becomes the priority over every other person in the world. Your mom, your dad, your best buddy, your boss. And children, once you have those, they make your home and family a priority over every other organization, activity, or pursuit in your life. Such a difficult thing to understand and accept. Now, we want the things that are produced with these attitudes. <laughs> we want peace and love and intimacy and fun and you know, we want all of that to continue with our spouse. But those type of things continue if we make our spouse a priority in our lives. You can't, you can't, you can't take your spouse and put him or her like fifth in line of your important things and expect also to have fun, intimacy, understanding, uh, productivity. And you can't just check in at home and how are the kids? Good, okay, well, I, I, I'll, after I read the paper, we'll talk. Oh, Thursday, that's my bowling night, you know, I mean, Thursday. I got, I, what about my me time? You, you can't have all your me time and all your stuff and, and your kids and your family and your home a third on the list and expect to have peace at home, children that obey. 
You've got to pay the price to get those things. So when both partners are committed first and foremost to one another and their family, they have then created the safe structure necessary to build a real home, no matter what kind of house or apartment they live in. A lot of people think, well, now we finally have a home. We've been married 11 years and we've saved up our money and we, have a, you know, we bought that house. Finally we have a home. I never lived in a, I never lived in a house till I was over 30 years of age. <laughs> Boarding houses, oh, I lived in those. Boarding house. Six strangers plus my mom, my dad and I sharing a bathroom down the hall. I've lived in apartments. I, they were my home. Why? Because my mom was there. And while he was alive, my dad was there. That was home. Kids do not care about square footage. <laughs> they don't care about square footage. Children care that mom and dad are there. That's what they care about. They couldn't care less about square footage. We care about square footage. Children care about accessibility. Are my parents there when I need them? And here's the difficult part about parenting. I'm not scolding you, I'm just telling you the difficult part about parenting is that they need you at the most inconvenient moments. If only they would need you, you know, every Wednesday at 6.30 or every Friday at 2 p.m. there's going to be a need. They don't, they need you at the worst possible times for you. A balanced environment. It doesn't sound very demanding when you say, well, a balanced environment, but that's, those are the things required to maintain balance in the home. And so the first element in our family mobile is a balanced environment created by a focused commitment by a man and a woman to build a home and a family, and here's the kicker, according to God's design, not our design not society's design. When we get married, there's no more me. Me is done with. Me is done. You give up me when you get married. It's now it's us. It's us, it's we. There's no more me. That's not a punishment. That's not a punishment. That's a blessing. It's a blessing when we finally enter into the we part of our lives, we. Why do I say that? Because God designed us to be we, not me. You know, when, when, when God says, and God is the one who says it, by the way. He says, it's not good for man to be alone. That's God saying that. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a partner suitable for him. Help me, someone actually that helped me, that word in the Hebrew, you know what it means? It doesn't mean like a helper, like you're on a brick job, you know, and your helper is stirring the mud for you, you know, and that, not that kind of helper. The Hebrew word means savior. Savior. I will make a savior for him. For, save him from what? Save him from me. A life of me. Save him from uh, uh, being alone, loneliness. So there's no more me once we, it's we. And once we have children, well, there's no more we. It's us, it's us. Every decision based on us. So balanced environment, there's a high cost, but it's worth it. Next element, a sense of home. Now home is more than just a place to sleep or to stay warm in. Home is where your memories live. It's where you are always welcome. 
It's the place you share with those you love. That's home. Your people lose their, um, their houses in tornadoes, right? Terrible, devastating thing, or to a fire or something like that. And of course, the, the news are there and they want to interview those people you know, uh, while they're going through this crisis. And I found the thing that they repeat the most, and I mean, uh, of course, is they say, well, we've lost everything, but we still have, you know, thank God our family is safe. You know, we, we made it through, our family is safe. And what they're really saying is we lost our house, but we didn't lose our home, because our home, our home is people. We didn't lose that. Better you lose the house and, and, and keep the home that you lose, you know, yeah, in the fire, I lost my husband and two children. Now, now you've lost your home. Now you've lost not only your house, but your home as well. The point I want to stress about home, however, is that somebody needs to create the home. Again, it doesn't happen all by itself. You do not have a home just because you bought a house. For example, our home, excuse me, our house, when children, our house, meaning our, me, Mike Mazalonga, our house, when the children lived at home, we had a stairway that went up to uh, the second floor from the dining room and you know, the bedrooms were upstairs and there was a, a wall. You, know, you go up the stairs and there's a wall that follows up. And on that wall, um, uh, if I would have called my, my niece, who's interior designer, and, and said to her, I want something you know, really nice for that wall, she could have come up and decorated it with all kinds of colorful uh, uh, paintings and objets d'art and whatever, pleasing to the eye, and it would have made a wonderfully decorated house. Instead, that wall was covered with family pictures from different periods. The wedding pictures of our two daughters, graduation photos from the military and college, a great picture of our son William surfing, all, <laughs> all in mismatched frames, different colors. I mean, it was a designer's nightmare. Ooh, it was terrible. <laughs> that wall got low marks for design but it clearly said that this house was a home to this family here. So all of these photos captured something that we did together. They described the culmination of hard work, cooperation, discipline, and joy that was shared at some time or another in the past. Although none of the things in the pictures happened in the house that we now live in where the pictures are hung, the family that meets there is home to one another. Because, you know, I, I'm not saying all preachers are like this. Many ministers, you know, they, 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 they come into a certain work and they, they, their life's work is one congregation. And that's a wonderful thing. Others move around. Well, we moved around. So if you've moved more than 20 times in a life of a marriage, dragging four kids with you, Home is not a house you're living in. <laughs> Home is when, you're, when the people are there. You know, every child in our family still has a key to mom and dad's house. Wherever Lisa and I moved, the kids had a key to get in. They have a key to get into our house now. Because it's still their home in a way. Not because the house is there, because we're there, we're there. And when they're with us and we're with them, that's home for us. You know, in my lifetime, I told you, I personally, I've moved 40 times, 40 plus times in my lifetime. It's hard to believe, but true. So no single house represents home to me or to our family. However, the shared experiences that Lisa and I have had with our children, things that we have purposefully done to cultivate our sense of family, these things are home to us, no matter where we live. So the family mobile, balanced environment, a sense of home, 
another element, a place for creativity, a place for creativity. We're made in the image of a creative divine being, so it's no wonder that human beings are creative. I mean, even Hitler, you know, probably most despised tyrant, certainly in the last several hundred years, you know, he was a painter. He aspired to be an artist, landscapes, things like that. Experts have looked at his paintings and say, well, you know, he was a good amateur, but he wasn't great. But still, he had the impulse, you know, he had a creative impulse. And my point is the family should be a place where creativity is nurtured and given an opportunity to be expressed. Every uh, member should be encouraged to express constructive, creative impulses, even if the first attempts may be amateurish and limited. Now creativity you know, is not just about music or art, but it's satisfying one's curiosity and creative impulse. Again, a, a personal story. I remember as a little boy, maybe eight years old, something like that, or nine, I wanted to build my own hockey game, you know, based on this. I don't know if, if you're a Canadian kid, you know what this is, a hockey game. You know, you've got rods and springs and levers and you can twist these players so they can you know, shoot the puck. And oh man, I hours and hours played this with my cousins when I was a kid. So all of a sudden I, I decided I'm going to build my own hockey game. Yes, oh, it's going to be great. You know? And my mother, at the time, she could have said, well, that's way too complicated. We can't get all the springs and levers needed to work you know, the, the, the parts and the players. And instead, she allowed me to find wood and glue, and I only had stationary little plastic hockey figures, some nails, gray paint to paint the wood so it would look like ice. And in the end, the final product was just a flat piece of wood with plastic hockey players glued on and gray paint slapped on. I mean, it didn't really work as a hockey game. But here's the point. For two days, I remember the creative rush of you know, uh, cutting and painting and making my hockey game. Oh, I'd get up, you know, oh, I couldn't the glue and wait for it. I had to wait for each player to get stuck on and then I'd paint the lines and oh, what a rush for two days. Of course, it didn't work as a hockey game. <laughs> I mean, you know, now what do you do with it? Now some may think that it, 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 it requires money or, 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 or personal artistic ability to provide a home that encourages creativity. You know, oh man, uh, mom's going to take on a third job so we can allow uh, Sissy to, to take ballet lessons. Well, that's very commendable. These things can be helpful, but what is needed most of all is the ability to allow the creative impulse to be born and expressed by those around you without destroying it with reasons that something will not work or why an idea is impractical. You know, my mom could have shot that thing down right away. She could have, she could have, you know, she could have said, like maybe I probably would have said, she could have said, Michael, see how these things work when you twist them? Look, let's turn the gain upside down. Notice there's a spring that goes there and a little lever and then it's attached and then it's welded to the player. And we, don't have the, we don't have a torch. I'm not going to get a torch to weld thing, blah, 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 blah. No. She said, OK, what, what will you need? Well, I need some wood. OK, let's find some wood. Yeah. There's plenty of time to evaluate things and analyze ideas without destroying the essential creative impulse which God has given all of us. You know, one of the most valuable features of the sacred family is its ability to produce ideas that ultimately honor God and bless others with beauty and service. But it starts at a young age with crazy, goofy things. OK, another piece that can be added to our family mobile. The family can be also a training ground for relationships. You know, when Lisa and I got married, they said, oh, you should have all your children you know, close together. They'll be friends. 
<laughs> so we had, we had four kids in five years and then they fought for the first 15 years. You know, so if I ever find that guy. <laughs> I mean really, it's a terrible things. Yeah, I remember once uh, Paul, our eldest, tied his younger sister to a pole in the basement. They were, they were playing uh, prison or something, you know, and Julia volunteered to be the prisoner or something like that. So he tied her up, I mean really tied her up, but then he turned out the lights and he left the basement and closed the door and left her in the dark, tied to the pole. <laughs> Needless to say, Lise was not amused when she came to Julia's rescue after hearing her cries from the basement. Oh man. Oh. But, you know, Julia was the first one to jump in and defend her brother if bigger boys were trying to bully him. Yeah, it's the way it works, right? A family is a training center for all kinds of relationships. It's where we first learn to say, I'm sorry. It's where we first learn to say, congratulations. It's where we first learn to say happy birthday or let's surprise dad or I'll lend you this if you share this with me. That's, it's in the family that we learn those type of things. One of the things that I most admired about my wife's family, you know, growing up as an only child, I didn't have the experience of you know, relationships with siblings. But the thing that I, and my wife, she did. She had four brother, one brother and three sisters, so they were a family of five. And the thing that I really, really appreciated about Mr. and Mrs. LaSalle was the way they trained their children that if one of them received a gift or a favor, the others were trained to be happy for that child. In other words, every time someone got a special, I, I, whatever it was, new, uh, new dancing shoes or a doll or something, all right, they didn't feel um, compelled to even out with the other four children. Now, I'm not talking about on your birthday or at Christmas. I'm just talking about, oh, you know, I don't know, grandma saw or mom saw something that can really be useful. You've been looking for it. She bought it, a new dress, a something, whatever. And the others were trained to say, good for you, I'm happy for you. Because my in-laws got the point across to their children, everybody, it'll all even out, don't worry about it. You, you'll get yours. This time it's your brother. You know, we're favoring him with something, whatever that is. But don't worry, your, your turn will come. It'll all come out in the wash. And they kept that attitude growing up. And I could see that attitude among my wife uh, and her sisters and, and her brother. It was a beautiful thing. It's a marvelous thing. Well, that's, school doesn't teach you that. You learn that in, in, the, in the family. In the sacred family, it's the place where children learn that other people are not machines or higher forms of monkeys, but rather made in the image of God too. That's why we treat them the way we do. Family is where we teach and learn that the solution to a difference of opinion or an insult or selfishness or a lie or fighting is not leaving to find another family. <laughs> this is your family. You're going to have to work it out inside your family. You don't get thrown out of your family. You don't quit your family. But those attitudes are taught they're taught, they're not, they're not wired in. Children have to learn that. So training within families is about relationships. And training within families about relationships should teach us about forgiveness and perseverance and discussing things and compromise and patience. You know, that's where you learn things. As far as the mobile, you know, if, if you're working with my uh, analogy here, as far as the mobile illustration goes, training in relationships is the wire that holds all the pieces together. Very important. We learn that in the family. School hopefully can 
reinforce these ideas, but they're introduced and they're reinforced always in the family. Today, thankfully, our children and their spouses and their, our, their children, uh, as, as this group knows, all live and worship here together in this church. We're thankful for that. And each considers the other three brothers and sisters their friends. So it looks like that guy who gave us that advice a long time ago, maybe he was right. Maybe he was right. The thing that we've taught our children was the idea that there are plenty of people out in the world that will hurt you. There are many people out there in the world who will love nothing better than to stab you in the back or disappoint you or speak badly against you. They're out there. You'll meet those people. Let's not do that to each other inside our family. We expect better of you in your relationship with one another inside our family. It's your family that defends you. Even when you're wrong, still, it's your family that you come home to when you've, you know, where, where did the prodigal son go? His uncle's house? <laughs> His best buddy's house? No, he went home. He went home. So home should be the place where you can always go back to. It should be that place. You can always go back home. It's great if you've succeeded and you're coming back home to share that success and glow in that success. All parents want that. But home also has to be that place that you can come back to when you've failed miserably and know that you will nevertheless be received because that's what gives you the courage to go on. 